Hey, 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 it's Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. Today we're installing a Ford Lightning Charger. This is a 100 amp, 240 volt circuit beast. At the end of this video, you're gonna have tips, tricks, pricing, everything you need to determine if you're doing it yourself or hiring out a pro. So, before jumping in, I wanna tell you, we've got a playlist, check the description, for other types of EV charging, like NEMA 1450 outlets, Tesla wall connectors, and other brands as well. Check the description. Let's jump right in. Here we go. Hey, we're here at Chad's house. Chad has a Tesla Model S, but that's not why we're here. We are here for the Ford Lightning. Chad, you're gonna give us a tour, give us the breakdown. Dude, I appreciate it. Yep. We're gonna hook this baby up and get home charging installed. That's 100 amps of pure EV charging power, which is insane. And I'm really excited personally. Well, I'm glad to have you here. There's all kinds of stuff I noticed right away. Can we have the tour? <laughs> sure. What are you looking for? Yeah, okay, so Chad, is this a charge port right here? That is. It's Front left? It's not like the Tesla. Tesla, you just walk up, right? This one you have to actually push. There's some work involved. Okay. I see a standard J1772 looks like. Yeah, and got that for the fast charge. Oh, beautiful, okay. But you're not using it most of the time, so you just leave it up. At least I don't at home. So. Yeah, how about, what are these here? Uh, indicates when it's being charged, so usually okay. it, it'll be like blue light, you know, 20%, 20%, so on. I don't know what that is, I guess that's uh, Just to, to engage on the cover? Yep. Okay. The other side looks like it has one of these. It doesn't, it's just fake. Got it. And you said it's got 11 outlets and a 240? Yeah, so the front trunk has a few outlets and the USB and the back is, I think it has four or five outlets. Mm, an assisted gate, that's nice. Oh yeah, it's a total power station there. Oh, yeah. You've got the tie down ports. One, two, three, four. Four, two. four on each side. A well lit bed, it's nice. Yep. Both from the uh, back of the cab as well as, yeah, there it is. That's handy, you know it. Yeah, one of the things, the camera on a lot of vehicles only works when you're backing up, right? Right. So this one, There's I the like, 240. I have a... Gasket and covers. Articles in the back, I can watch it as I'm driving down the road. Nice. So it doesn't make it nice. But, and a lot of times I'm hauling plywood or something. So I've got, this is a new house, but I've got plenty of projects inside sure busy no that's good what what's going on here this looks dynamic is anything special uh, you've just got workstation yeah a measurement gauge that's cool just add a little detail anything yeah I do I can put clamps in there have you seen uh, that before no no oh my goodness I am getting old I do have two new hips so <laughs> well good for you Oh yeah, that was easy. Because the truck is, it's up. It's not your low rider. So that's a, that's a huge help, you know, it, for yeah, injury avoidance. Uh, one of our considerations was for the Rivian. And it's just, yeah. it was a little too small for our needs. So Got it. this one just fits us perfectly. Plus all of the attachments I had and accessories for our last truck fit this and so made it nice. Was it a Ford? No, it was actually a short bed uh, tight. So, Got it. Yep. Got it. Yeah, but this is a full-size truck. This, this is a boss right here. Uh, this one I upgraded to the max towing capacity, which is 10,000 pounds. Uh, the main reason is because I really like this YouTuber. His name's uh, Monroe. Have you seen him? Monroe no. and Associates? No. So he owns a company in Michigan, and he used to work for all these, I think Ford and a bunch of other uh, manufacturers. And now he has his own engineering company where they buy vehicles and tear them down. And he tore these down. He was comparing the standard battery with the extended battery. And the extended battery had a second heat pump on it for cooling down the battery. And he wow. said that was for the max towing. And the way it works, it's like, you know, if we do go on longer trips, I didn't have to, didn't want to worry about uh, the battery overheating or anything like that, even if I'm not towing 10,000 pounds, I think it's good to have, because it was a, about a thousand dollar option, but I think it's well worth it for, you know, just not having to worry about any issues. Yep, peace of mind, peace of mind. I like all the lights. Everything's really well lit around the exterior, in the bed, around the, around, the, you know, your 
uh, what is that called again? The back of the running board. Running board. Yeah, it does have uh, lighting. You can control all that. So like in a campground setting, the whole thing could light up all the way around. Nice. And you can just, you can tell it what lights to turn on and off. That's it. Oh man, that's great. Yeah, I'm testing dash cams right now. So that's why the wires are there. They won't be there in the future. Nice. No, that's good. Cooled seats. Heated and cooled. Heated and cooled. But you need in Indiana. Zero to 100 degrees. Never know when it might be. Can we take a look at the frunk? Oh, yeah, of course. Whoa! <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> there is a drain in there, so you could use it as a cooler if you're tailgating. Oh, uh, what? No way. That's amazing. Oh, just it. put a, a, ice in there and yep. oh, psh. can't do that in our Tesla. No. Is there a 240 here as well or no? No, nope, not in that one. 2.4 kilowatts. That's a this. ton of juice. <laughs> Chad, come on. <laughs> no, but I also have a drone license, so it's nice to be able to charge as you know you're driving around and not have to. I used to have to take extra, so many extra battery packs. Yes. Now I don't, so. Yes, I feel like having onboard outlets, at least the 120s, is an absolute must for every vehicle today. Ice or otherwise, I yep. feel like you got to have it. It's the world we live in. And, uh, you know, the back 240, I can charge her Tesla. I had to buy a little adapter for it, but use that plus her travel charger. Mm -hmm. Charges her Tesla if she ever gets in trouble. That's cool. Golf bags? It says golf bags. You're not gonna, I'm not going to be able to fit my driver in that bag. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It looks a little, t little tight, a little tight. Junior golf bags. Golf bag That's bag. your driver we're talking about too, yeah. right? Yeah. Man. Okay. I'm a little surprised. Okay. I wouldn't even try it. You know, it's a truck. You just throw it in the back. Right? right. That's what you're used to. But it's nice to get keep it protected if you have a stop at the whatever store on the way. Well, I bought that bag because the Tesla's so small and we go on long trips, it's nice to just take a, a few clubs. Yeah. Well, I, I see the air intake down here. That's interesting. Tesla doesn't have that. Looks like a big cooling system for the massive battery. Is yeah, that... and it's uh, interesting. So when it's warmer out, that thing just turn, comes up and down on its own. So you'll be walking by and hear some random noise and that's what it is. Okay. Wow. It does. It has a... Uh, they call it an air dam underneath too, so on highway or at faster speeds it drops down to help with the aerodynamics. Titan cost me about 35 cents a mile to drive. Uh, this thing's five or six cents. Oh. That's based on our electricity. Of course this is twice the price as the Titan, so you have to look at that, but we're in a position where that doesn't matter as much. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's good a good breakdown. A, the, the annoying things are, you know, we like to donate things to like uh, Habitat, the Restore, you know, or yeah. we like to, to go to Goodwill or even just simple recycling, right? Where if you go into recycling for free, it's about a, I don't know, a 30 mile round trip. Well, the truckies cost me 10 bucks to go <laughs> to do a free recycling where this thing is. You know, 30 miles, you're looking at $1.50. So, you know, those little things add up over time. Yeah, big time. So this is my first time to lay hands on the Ford Lightning Charger. I'm excited. I've been through the instruction manual. It looks like it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We are not doing the high voltage DC whole home backup today. Later video, stay tuned. Maybe, maybe. So here it goes. There's the external cover. This is the waterproofing cover. Contains Let's just see how that works. Boom, there it is. Pistol holder, which is standard with wall boxes. I appreciate that. And then there's the back mounting plate and here are the brains of the operation. If you're considering doing this project yourself, um, caution, high voltage, extreme death may occur. But you might be able to do it. By the end of this video, let's check it out. I'm gonna dive in, walk you step by step. Let's see what we've got. So this is the real estate at the back of Chad's garage. We've got a 200 amp panel, 100 amp panel, connected to a 400 amp capacity service outside, GFCI plug, existing NEMA 1450 outlet, 
for Tesla charging right there. And what we're gonna do to keep everything pretty today is cut drywall from below the 200 amp panel across here to the charger location. And then Chad's gonna patch it up because he's got that skill set. Super handy guy. Okay, let's check out the tools we're gonna utilize for this installation. Because I'm an electrician, I do have some tools standing by and I'll show you if I use those too. But I've got my standard hand tools. I anticipate I'll use a number two square drive screwdriver. I'm gonna use probably both a large and small flathead, 3.5 mil and 5.5 mil. Like my VDE tools, this is, these are wear screwdrivers, super comfortable. Gonna be using my Knipix, 1000 volt rated knife for stripping the heavy cable. And I'll need to be stripping the jacket on the wires as well. So there's a south wire, seven and one. Love that thing. 100 amp breaker for terminating my number three copper conductors to the panel. This is my south wire ratcheting cutter for cutting my cable to length. I've got one inch connectors here. 9 16 driver for my lags for mounting the charger. That's a T20 Torx bit that's required for all the cover screws in the Ford Lightning charger. I've got my tester for final validation. That's a Venlab, super nifty little pocket tester. My DeWalt, 20 volt with a one and an eighth inch self-feeding auger bit for drilling through my studs. I've got my 20 volt impact driver with a number two square bit for pulling the panel cover screws off. DeWalt laser on a tripod to get nice clean straight lines across the drywall. And of course, I've got this number three three conductor with a ground copper cable. Must be 90 degrees C rated. That's 90 degrees Celsius. Must be copper and must be number three. This is a readily accessible cable from any of the major wire centers like Southwire, Wire and Cable Your Way, um, but I did have to pay an expediting fee to get it here in time. Some of the quotes for coming back, 10 weeks. It's a lot of copper. You definitely wanna measure your installation and cut or order to length. You hear that? That was all copper. <laughs> Let's rock this out. Woo. <laughs> Watch out for that. A little carried away. I don't want to rip off the end of my thumb. I do highly recommend safety gloves and glasses. The safety gloves should have cut resistance. These panels are live, right? These are energized. Take appropriate precautions. If you're not a qualified individual, you might want to keep your hands out of here. As we said earlier, extreme death may apply. In some jurisdictions, homeowners are not allowed to get into the box and that's tightly enforced. You've got to know your local codes and standards. You've got to know what projects in what jurisdictions require a permit and which do not. And let me give you a couple tips for pulling the panel cover off safely. I'm applying pressure with my left hand here to hold the cover to the wall get everything out of my hands so I can work safely with two hands. Usually I'm going to grab the cover at the bottom or the side while maintaining pressure. I'm going to rock it out of there and pull it away. Last thing I want to do is trip and drop that panel cover back into the panel because this is metal and that's energized and it could become electrified. All right, <clears throat> a nice square D home line 200 amp panel is what we're working with today. I am gonna be relocating the gas furnace circuit over to this panel. This is gonna function as the critical loads panel. And the concept that Chad, I think very wisely put forth is he may utilize in the future his 240 volt output, a generator mechanical interlock. If you don't know what that is, check out this video here to then back feed from his Ford Lightning to his critical loads panel while managing his circuits and his power during an outage. I think that's genius. And I think he could get it done for less than 400 bucks in materials doing it himself. Yeah, okay, so Chad's got the best idea from a drywall standpoint. We're gonna go vertically, make a vertical cut on both ends, open this all the way up, and that's gonna give us one, an easier pass on the drywall and avoiding an awkward hump. Two, 
It's going to give us total visibility because this is a congested area with all of these circuits here. So we'll be able to see exactly what we're up against and avoid existing wiring. So I'm going to make a level mark. Obviously the level is going to determine that for me. No laser required and just take it from here. Now the simplest way to get through the installation is simply turn your DeWalt laser on high and allow it to sit for approximately one hour and you just pull that right out of there. It's beautiful. <laughs> That's misinformation. Our studs are two by sixes framed 24 on center. So I'm coming off this stud, I'm going 24 inches to the left and I'm gonna mount that forward lightning charger. Boom, right there. Now the sense in that is the unit itself <clears throat> doesn't have a lot of weight, but the cord is a 25 foot copper cord and that's got some weight to it. So it's supplied with 916 slag bolts for bolting right to the stud. So that's what we're going to do. And we are going to pilot those holes with a 732nd bit. Chad's cutting the insulation out of the way. So we've got a clean wiring path. Appreciate that, bro. I want to make sure this is a comfortable and convenient height for you. Something you'll interact with, you know, one, two times a week. Looks good. Is that comfortable? Yeah, I think so. Okay, your wife too? Seems like she's, she's got tall. plenty of altitude, <laughs> yeah. Okay, put a, put a level on it, line it up with the stud driller pilot bit, and when we're satisfied with the location of the charger, then we'll have a destination on this end and that end. We'll have a clear wiring path, we'll be able to pull and terminate cable. That's it. Okay, so this is our wiring compartment and uh, Ford's got a nifty little deal where they're designed for this thing to fit right over a two gang electrical box. So if you've already got a NEMA 1450, you can just bring that existing wiring into your charger, which is really cool. And then there's an adjustment dial that you can utilize to control the rate of charge. We're using the 80 amp, which is the true current draw that is required to be put on a 100 amp breaker because of the NEC 125% continuous load requirement. So that's our wiring destination from the panel for, with our 100 amp cable. Yeah, that's actually something we considered in our other garage was uh, if you were too expensive for me uh, because of the uh, mobile charger that comes with it is limited yeah. at 32 amps. Got it. Right, but that's a 50 amp breaker in there. Uh huh. So I could bump this up to 48 and still get a faster charge and do it myself. Sweet. But, hey, you're right on the money. So right here. That's great. Okay. You okay. So check the back side of the wall. That's clear before I cut my hole. I saw how my wiring hole in my charger lines up with the mounting plate mounting bracket. And it's right here at the bottom. So I'm going to cut a hole just big enough for my wire with my keyhole saw. You do this with an oscillator, but again, the advantage of using hand tools over power tools in a situation like this is this garage has storage, right? We've got bikes and lawn tools and, and recreational equipment. And, and if I use powered equipment in the garage, I'm going to put a plume of dust in the air. That's going to put a fine white coat on everything that I'm going to be responsible for. I did bring painters plastic just in case, but if I can contain it and drop all the dust right down to the floor, use a broom and dustpan to clean up when I'm done. That's a plus from the customer perspective and from mine. And the other thing I'm doing is see, I've got my cut resistant gloves here. I'm actually intentionally pinching my blade right there so that I'm controlling the depth that I'm using on my keyhole saw because I don't want to plunge too far into the wall. I've actually one time as an apprentice, I punched out the back side of the wall because I was careless about the depth of the saw. And so I was responsible for touch up drywall and paint. I think in the dining room, ah, so embarrassing. There it is. It's time to drill our holes and pull some wire. Uh, my question is if we had two by four walls instead of these two by six, is there enough room 
to make this straight across or do you have to go into the basement up and around? That's a great question. So the code does speak to that. You've got to have an inch and a quarter of framing material between the edge of your hole and the face of framing in order to protect from a standard drywall screw, for instance, which tends to be inch and a quarter. And so if you don't, if you've got two by four walls and we're drilling a one and an eighth inch hole, then what we end up with is an inadequate clearance. Then you can utilize nail plates and they've actually left us a nice little load of nail plates here. And that is a standard electrical project product available in any home store. So you could drill your hole closer to the face of this framing, nail plate it, and uh, be in good code compliant shape. So did they even need the nail plate on here? Because there's like two and a half, three inches there. Right, no, it's not required by code. They, okay. uh, they didn't put them over there, but I think just because of the congestion of this area, they included it. Yeah, and that image I'll send you has nail plates on the other side. So you, nice. you can tell that that's not very far from the edge. Right, I think that's a good piece of due diligence. Right. I'm, I'm proud of them. Okay, before we drill our holes, I wanna make sure my cable's gonna be long enough. Oh, sorry about that. Whoop. And I'm sure it is. Thanks for holding that side, Chad. Okay, we've got tons. We've got oh, plenty. Yeah, you can go to the basement. <laughs> yeah. You, you never know what you might encounter. A little extra is nice, but at 12 bucks a foot, you know, you gotta watch it too. Well, I'm assuming I paid for the whole wire. Right? <laughs> yeah, you can have the leftovers. <laughs> you use them to, you know, increase power to your toaster or something. Okay, so if you, we had gone into the basement, what we'd need to do is plug up our holes with bat insulation like this, faceless, paperless bat insulation or firecock. Going horizontally through these studs, these are not fire studs and don't require a firecock barrier. Firecock is simply anything that resists smoke and flame that's compliant with the local standard. So three horizontal holes here, no need, but if we'd punched into the basement, it would be required, and that's one of the differentiators in this project of doing it yourself and hiring an electrician is understanding the important nuances of the code like that. All right, next we're gonna bring our cable up into the box, and I'll show you a couple tips and tricks. First is, don't drop your lock nut, right? Just stick your finger in there and spin it off. I hate dropping hardware and having to bend over five, six extra times a day, wearing out my poor little back to pick up silly little things like drop screws and lock nuts. So I'm gonna go ahead and pre-install this clamp on my cable because I won't be able to tighten the clamp due to the drywall after the fact. So I'll hold it up. I'm gonna allow a little extra down here. I don't need it, I, in fact, I don't want it tight as a piano string. That's not my, in, in my, to my benefit. So here's the scoop. My ground is gonna terminate all the way up here. That's my only available ground terminal. So I'm actually gonna need to pull a little bit more. There we go. This is too long for my other conductors, but again, that's where my ground is terminating. Grounds and neutrals have been separated in this panel, which is a good proactive measure. And in some cases, absolutely positively required by the code. And so I'm gonna stick with that standard. Ground up there, neutral down here. I'm gonna locate my 100 amp breaker in the bottom of this panel. This is probably where most DIYers go wrong. They fail to use an appropriate cable clamp. They simply knock out the KO and bring the conductors into the box. And that does constitute a code violation. It puts your house at risk that the edge of that box, that sharp metal edge is gonna wear on your cable or your conductors over time and you're gonna have a dead short or possibly a high resistance short. When you're tightening that cable, don't death grip the connection. You can actually crush the wires inside of the jacket. Just get a snug connection to where the connector will no longer move easily by hand. So that's what we're looking for. Let's knock out our KO. I really need to be using my beater screwdriver for this. Careless. I'm gonna switch to my beater screwdriver for removing the knockout. That makes so much more sense. I apologize to the Wera fans out there for my carelessness. All right, you gotta take it easy. If you don't take it easy, what you'll do is you'll bust out the other knockouts. This is, these are concentric knockouts 
and they'll all pop out. So you just have to go slow, wiggle it back and forth. It's like removing the drywall. Finesse is the best. Back and forth, come on, uh-oh. Uh-oh, don't do that to me. Oh, it's getting dicey. Oh, what? All right, transition tools to my uh, south wire. I like these because uh, needle nose and I still have plenty of strength and grab. Nothing rinky dinky. And I got it out. Um, my concentric knockouts are a little bit deformed, so I'm just going to pinch them back up into place here. If I had uh, popped them completely out, what I'd need to do is fill the void by means of reducing washers like this. See, that simply allows my connector to fit, lock nut on one side, one reducing washer inside, one outside, and that would fill in the gap. And those are also available in any home supply store. Okay, so I've got my knife here, which is really cool. It's got that little nub to prevent damage to the conductors, and that's intentional. Did you put that nub on there? No, <laughs> Knipix put that nub on there for us. It's absolutely beautiful. So what I can do, well, this is a pretty heavy jacket. I can slip that in there and just run it right down there, right? Still going to require some human effort here. All right. See that? See that? It smells like a brand new pair of sneakers from Finish Line. That's what that smells like. I feel like I'm a 14 year old buying a pair of Nikes with my hard earned summer mowing cash. Every time I strip a cable like this. So you could purchase THHN, which is the type of single strain conductor. It would, it would show up on a spool looking just like this. And you can buy it cut to length from the uh, electrical supply stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards. They all have those cut to length um, custom order wire centers. Uh, but this is nice in that it's all color coded, right? And I've got them all contained within an overall jacket. And this is the smallest trimmest solution you're gonna be able to find. If you put these conductors in conduit or uh, whether that's a rigid or flexible conduit, it's going to be a larger overall conduit. You're going to be up to the inch and a half, uh, at least inch and a quarter size um, to make all this fit. And as it is, I've got an overall diameter of this cable of approximately three quarters of an inch, which is really easy to work with. Now you'll notice I am pulling in neutral here. That is a practice that Jefferson Electric has determined is just worth it. I'm not actually going to use this neutral in the installation. It's a 240 volt plus ground. So this is strictly spare for whatever the heck might be required in the future. But I don't want to have to do this again. And I don't want my customer to have to pay twice. Hey, okay, pause. Let's take a look outside at the electrical and metering equipment. So you get a better sense maybe for your situation and the best course of action. Let's go. Yeah, okay, so this is a classic confusion even amongst apprentice electricians. This is called a 320 amp meter base. That's 320 amps of continuous load. However, you can connect a 200 amp, as we've got here, and a 100 amp, making for 300, or you could take an additional 100 off the side or just 200 altogether. So you can have by code on this meter cabinet, two 200s. Now there are a couple considerations, and one is the utility cable that's servicing this meter cabinet needs to be rated for the load that's served. Now generally speaking, they're putting in 500 KC mil. That pops from here to the transformer, which is just 20 feet away. You're gonna be in great shape. So there's future capacity here, but we are all the way on the other side of the home. So the disconnects are absolutely required. Grounds and neutrals, since the panels are not the main disconnecting means, must be separated as they are. We're in good shape there. But we've got capacity for a third EV, and this customer has two kids, so that's a real possibility. Hey, if you haven't seen what an electrical arc can do, you need to check out this video right here. It's pretty mind-blowing. Lots of heat, lots of juice packed into these things. You always want a tool-tight or wrench-tight connection. So what I'm doing is I'm wiggling my cable, spinning that lock nut, and then once it starts to seat hard, I'll give it some love taps with my onboard hammer. 
So I'm gonna tape up the end of this neutral cable. I'm not gonna terminate it and go through the paces on that. I'm just gonna close it up and make sure that that end does not come in contact with life parts. Simple measure. All right, so I put your breaker in. Crikey. So I'm just gonna take it and put it in the lowest available, sorry, highest available position on this side. You know what, I'm gonna reverse that. I made a split second decision. I'm gonna put it over here. And okay, so you lock in the tabs on the outside. And then you push it in. Careful not to let your hands slip off and into the bus. That's just a press fit, is all that holds it in place. One thing we're gonna look at is torquing down our terminations. For now, standard screwdrivers apply. Open up the ter terminal all the way. And the reason I put it on the left side is because I just wanna have a little available conductor length. So what I'm gonna do is bring it around like that and terminate my conductors. But look at that, that gives me about 18 inches inside of the panel. Occasionally something goes bad, a breaker burns up, um, terminals overheat, and that could be installation error, it could be lack of properly torqued terminations, but what I'd have the ability to do is to tighten up those wires, cut them back, because they overheat, everything just gets scorched, turns black. You've gotta cut it back to have that good clean copper, and you might be forced to flip the breaker around to this side, but with that 18 inches of conductor, you've got the luxury to do that. Okay, so the other consideration when you're terminating this breaker is uh, your phases, right? So here at the top of the panel, what you'll see is you've got one black incoming conductor, which should be on the left, and this one with the red stripe, which is on the right. And then you've got um, L1, L2, alternating every other breaker down the bus, and in this case, L1 is on the top of this breaker and is going to receive my black conductor. Um, in a residence, by far and at large, if you get that wrong, everything's gonna work, but when you pay attention to those details, particularly in a commercial application, it can make all the difference in the world, um, but it's the right way to do it, so we're gonna do it that way. All right, we're gonna cut our wire to length, right there. And this number three copper is, it's a little bit meaty, so I'm using my ratcheting Cutters from Southwire, really like those one hand operation. Absolutely fantastic. You notice that when people terminate aluminum conductors, which this is not, they'll use an anti-oxidation compound. For copper, you can go straight into the breaker, but just pay attention to the rating of your terminals. No wires that are too small or too large should be terminated to terminals that are not rated for that. And uh, terminals will also include whether they are rated for copper and or aluminum conductors, which most breaker terminals are. Get a full seat, and then I'm gonna wiggle to allow the strands of that breaker to seat to get the maximum connectivity. Wiggle as I tighten, and I'm not gonna overdo it. I'm not gonna scar the terminals. I'm just gonna leave it right there and come back with the torque screwdriver, which will finish out the job. Rinse and repeat. Oh, look at that, terminal's coming out. Terminal screw, I overdid it. Rinse and repeat with your red conductor. So what does the temperature rating of wire have to do with anything anyways? Well, quite a bit actually. So this is 90 degrees C wire, right? 90 degrees C Celsius, and everything in the code is in metric, and some or most things are also in SAE. So the insulation of the conductor actually makes the difference in its ampacity, its current carrying capacity. Because when copper or aluminum carry current, they're actually gonna heat up and you want the insulation to remain completely intact and uncompromised during the operation of that circuit. And so you can get wire that's as low as 60 degrees Celsius, 75 or 90. There are some 105 and other applications of course, but generally speaking, building wire today is rated to 90 degrees Celsius, and that is required in order for this copper conductor to maintain its full ampacity in order for three gauge copper to carry the 100 amp load required by the Ford Lightning charger. And I didn't realize this, but some of the Ford Lightning vehicles, trim level X and above, come standard with the charger, which is provided from Sunrun, now, Chad, you said you had the experience that that was provided in about eight weeks as opposed to the promised. Correct, I think I just got lost in the filing system somehow and I just had to call them a few times to get back on the list. 
once they uh, put me on the list, it only took about a week. And I think when you get your truck, it, that's if your dealer's on top of things, you should get it in about a week. Nice. So one of the aspects of the code is continuous load. That's something that under normal conditions operates for three hours or more. And that is gonna create lots of heat over the long run. Think of it, your dryer, your oven, your stove, your water heater, nothing like that operates for three hours or more under normal conditions. Those are not considered continuous load. Interestingly enough, all lights are considered continuous load with very, very few exceptions, if any. And so an EV charger, it could literally be cranking all night long, eight, 10, 12 hours, depending on the capacity of the vehicle and the rate of charge. And so you're gonna get heat over time and that is why you need the high temperature rating of the wire and the 125% safety factor of the circuit. So 80 amps of actual draw, but 100 amp breaker and 100 amp rated wire and that's 25% above 80. Okay, now we're here ready to put this bracket on the wall. I'm gonna do that before I pull my wire through so I don't have to fight it. And these are the supplied lag bolts, nice and beefy. Line it up with my pre-drilled holes and we're off and cooking. Okay, so two things I want you to know about these lags. One is a 916 driver puts them in. Two, if you create a conflict between the lag and all that massive holding strength and the plastic, the plastic's gonna lose. So take it easy, Tiger. Put these things gently, gently. I'm hanging to the right here just a bit, right on the line. Flip it around. If I get the exact same read, then my level is good. If I got the opposite read, then it means my level's off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen the lag and bring that, boom, just a 64th over. Okay, let's get our cable in the wall. I'm gonna watch out so I don't tear up my insulation. I want it to remain intact. Nice and easy does it. And then also, the cable's so heavy, you can easily just break your drywall if you're not paying attention. There will be some tension as we take this kink out. So just go slowly. We've got our connector in the back of the, the main box here, the mothership. Pull our cable through. Gonna have to get the right angle on our cable because this is, as you can see, not a flat back. Easy. It's nice having a two by six wall at this at this moment. Easy. And one thing I do like. Okay, I'm gonna level with you. Tesla wall connectors don't have this, and that is this substantial back plate, which is gonna keep my wall from getting all scarred up and, and dirty because this cable's gonna lay across the floor and plug into the vehicle and it's gonna come up dirty. And what you have with the Tesla wall connector is kind of this like scuffy, scuzzy. Well, now you've got a half inch standoff and a nice big back plate. I think that's smart Ford, good work. Okay, snug, not death grip, done. Here we go. It's nice, it's got that T. You know it, so you know when you're seated, you're in there just right, you can feel it, it'll hold its position while you get these screws in, holes line up perfectly. So I've got this nice long T20 to get it all the way back in there, which is what's required. Oh, don't strip it. So this is one place you could really be fighting it if you didn't have a long T20 Torx and it was not supplied in the bag. So if you're gonna tackle this project, I'd recommend this bit right here. Mine's a Master Force from Menards. Okay, now that we've got this thing seated firmly to the wall, let me tell you a couple things. You can put this outdoor, it's outdoor rated. The cover is gasketed, and as long as it's 18 inches above the floor or ground, you're good to go. So that's a really nice feature. Also typically available in all the other chargers and wall boxes, indoor outdoor rating. So I'm gonna cut my cable to length, strip it back, make my terminations, throw the breaker, voltage test, put the cover on, plug in the vehicle. Oh, I forgot the torque. I'm gonna to torque things down too. We're almost there. Put that white conductor 
neatly and safely out of the way. Again, that's just for future. I have to say, so far, so good. Ford has done a really nice job with the instructions. You've got the torque settings clearly listed in the instruction manual, which is completely lucid. I love it. You've got torque label here on the equipment label. It's just, I feel like it's pretty cut and dry, pretty good, pretty user friendly, pretty, 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 pretty great. All right, black on the left, red on the white. Don't strip it back too far, but definitely don't get any insulation underneath your terminal screw or inside your terminal. Good clean strip. Don't damage your conductor. All right, you can see right in there, you wanna get the full conductor seated. All right, wiggle it, wiggle it. Get that thing seated. This right here, don't wiggle it so hard you break your, your board. This right here, these terminations are probably the single most important aspect Okay, so this torque screwdriver goes up to 50 inch pounds, and this is a 60 inch pound rated terminal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it there, I'm gonna wiggle and see it as I go. Hang with me here. We're gonna check, make sure that terminal is in the right. Sorry, the insulation of the conductor is not inside the terminal. That is nicely seated. Let's take it all the way there. Okay, so that's 50. We're gonna go a little bit past. That's probably 55. And there it is. I'm gonna leave it right there. Do not wanna exceed 60 and risk shearing off the terminal. Okay, so you'll notice gap on the side at the bottom here. There's a little bit of resistance there. The pistol recess right here was pushing on my conductors. So I wanted to make sure I didn't have anything sharp at the back when there is relief. And both of those conductors have the ability to be completely out of the way. So I'm in good shape there, mild resistance. Okay, so there are four screws from the heart to the mounting plate. There are nine screws from the cover to the, the heart of the operation, but this overall is just half of the Ford solution. The other half is a backup system where you can actually take energy from the massive battery in your Ford Lightning and pump it back into your house to operate your home during an outage. And here's a tip, electric vehicles are incredibly cost-effective forms of backup battery storage. They come with tires and wheels and transportation, everything else, but they're produced in factories at scale. So if you wanna buy whole home battery backup, an EV is an incredibly cost-effective way to do that. I'm hoping all EV manufacturers will have a backup solution like Ford, but Ford seems to have beaten everybody to the punch, and that's pretty impressive to get emergency power from your vehicle. Just think about it. If your neighborhood was out, you could take your EV, go charge it up in a different part of town, fill your tank, come back and power your home for another couple of days or a week. That battery is so big, if you manage your loads well, you could have a week of autonomous power. No joke. So if you're installing this thing outside, you wanna be really careful about two things. Hmm, make it three. One is the gasket inside the cover could become dislodged and not get fully seated and you would have water infiltration. Two, if you left any of your screws loose or got them discombobulated and the cover was a little bit cocked and jammed, you could have an issue there too. And thirdly, you wanna prevent ice buildup because melting ice is so weird. Do you know that melting water from ice can actually even run uphill at times, depending on the situation. So you really wanna prevent ice buildup. If you can, with any, the eave on your home or anything, that can provide a little bit of shelter for equipment outdoors. Okay. Boom, right in. Okay, three, two, one, boom. That sounds good. That sounds good. Let's just check our voltage over here. Okay, so I'm gonna put one terminal to the ground wire for that circuit. I'm gonna to touch line two, 122.9, which is good. And line one, 122.9 as well. So, you know, quick conversation. In the old days, they used to call it 110. Well, that's because it just ran a little cooler, 110 volts on average. Now it's called 120 on average, which is the same nominal voltage given a new name over time because we tend to trend higher. Maybe at some point we'll be calling it 130. So this is a 240 volt circuit because between line one and line two, we've got 246 
0.1, which is a nominal 240 volts. Right? So that's it. Looks good. Okay, now that this baby's fired up, for context, let me tell you what. This is a 100 amp breaker. Tesla wall connectors are generally installed on 60 amp breakers, and a lot of home level two chargers are 30 or 40 amp breakers. So this 100 big boy bad boy is super impressive. Yeah, okay, so what does that mean, right? So the EV market uses MPH, miles of range per hour of charge. How many miles per hour are you getting? For context, this baby is gonna fire up your vehicle, uh, depending on the capacity of your vehicle, in let's say six hours instead of 10 on a slower charge. So generally speaking, the level two home charging will fill up your tank overnight. Now the question is, on those quick turnaround times when you're coming in empty, grabbing a sandwich back out the door for kids sports, how fast are you gonna get a topper? And the more juice you've got, the quicker that topper can happen. Okay, so here in the Westfield market, an electric vehicle charging station in a garage is not required to be permitted, oddly enough. Some jurisdictions in the Metro Indy area, they definitely require it. What does it cost to install an electric vehicle charging station at a level two range in a garage just like this? Generally speaking, a project like this is gonna run 1,000 to 1,500 bucks. Now you always have to consider who's responsible for drywall repairs and touch-up paint. Is there a permit involved? Labor and materials all included their parameters and that price can swing one way or the other a little bit. In addition, I also recommend surge protection as your main panel to help protect the valuable asset of the EV. All right, when I was going through the installation, at some point it was not plugged in and the Ford app basically kept giving me an error and I was losing connectivity. But as soon as I plugged it in, I'm allowed to now hit the next step where before it wouldn't let me continue. But it also didn't tell me to plug it in, right? So there should be a little step in there that says plug it in. And now it's letting me install everything, so. If we go to vehicle. It's charging. See, I'm not seeing, it's not like the Tesla that shows you everything, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll go in the, this thing, it just shows the current uh, state of charge. It doesn't really show me a rate of, char of charge. So let me go here. Yeah, see, uh, that's the, that's a downfall. Now Ford does have a new update but they phase in the latest software updates. So it could just be that I don't have the latest update, right? Uh, so in this case, I think I just have to time it for you <laughs> to get an idea. Uh, although, what we can do is look at this time, right? To go from 55% to 90%, it says we'll be ready by 530. But if I plug in that NEMA 1450, and we can see the, the difference in times, that could be one way to do it. Yep. So a little over two hours shaved off of our charge time to add 35% battery, which in this case is probably in the 45 kilowatt. Yeah, okay, sneak peek. We did a little other work while the camera wasn't watching and we relocated the furnace circuit from here to this. And that's because this will function at some point in the future as a critical loads panel and we wanted to do that move while the drywall was open. So let's put this panel cover back on and <clears throat> this job's almost a wrap. But I got a couple more things for you. Okay, one more thing before I put this last screw in the cover. Check that out. That is a pan head blunt tip panel cover screw. And that's required by code. You can't use like regular old drywall screws and stuff like this. So if your panel has the wrong screws in it, pointy tips, that's gonna get called out in the home inspection when you try to sell your home. And they'll need to be replaced. Run on down to the supply house or, or the home hardware store and you can buy those in little packs of six. Yeah, okay, two more things for you. That vacant spot right there is a hazard and we need to put a closer plate. Don't have one in my possession. That'll be done here in the near future. And secondly, if you've got an EV, there's an auto owner's club for that EV. For instance, the Ford Lightning Club has got like 20,000 members. It's a great place and resource for information. Let's button this up. 
And that's a wrap, but hold it. Maybe you're in a situation where you've got a NEMA 1450 receptacle. Let me show you what we're gonna do today. We're gonna swap this out for an industrial NEMA 1450, ground in the top position, so it lays and hangs flat down the wall when you plug in the mobile charger. And this is about an $85 outlet that requires a larger faceplate, and that is about a $10 outlet. This is highly recommended for electric vehicle charging because of the size and duration of the energy draw. That creates heat, and these NEMA 1450s have been known for dramatic failure. So if you're interested in that video, click here and subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money. Hey, wait, 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 wait. I forgot to tell you to label the breaker. Every breaker has to be labeled by code. Make it something distinct and unique from everything else that's not occupancy specific. Ford Lightning Charger, how's that?